and uh, we can pray, and we will get into our study for this evening, Romans chapter 14. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for all that you're doing for us. Lord, I pray you'd be here with us this evening as we look at your word. I pray you'd speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we would become more like you. What a glorious thing it is to serve the living God. Cover us, keep us, mold us, shape us, and make us more like you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Romans chapter 14. And as we, uh, as we go through these last few chapters in the book of Romans, uh, we need to remember the beginning of chapter 12 because that led in to all of this section, all of these chapters, and all that led up to those verses in chapter 12 is important because it set the doctrine that we need to hold on to when we consider what it is to be a Christian. And we need to think of those verses so that we can keep all of it in context in the context of submission to God, so that we can be transformed by God, so that we are not conformed to the world and to our flesh. All of which we are told by Paul is our reasonable service. It's our duty to God. And will make us view pretty much everything differently than the world does. Chapter 12 began with these verses. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then through the rest of that chapter, the rest of chapter 12, Paul tells us primarily how to function within the body of Christ, how to function in the church. He reviews the gifts of the Spirit and how they should be active in our lives. And then Paul covers how we should be acting towards one another, preferring each other in love and showing the relational traits that are consistent with loving God and loving other people. And from there, Paul in chapter 13 discussed how the believer should function in society. And he covered how we should recognize and respect governmental authority. And also inside of that, what our responsibility toward God is and how we should view our neighbor. And that all of it, how to respond to God, how to be the body of Christ, how to act towards one another, how we should respond to and view those in authority over us, how we should act toward our neighbor, and the urgency with which we should be viewing all of these things, that it all comes from transformation and is born of and sustained by love. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Submission to God allows for transformation in our lives and will keep us from being conformed to the world. And now here in chapter 14, Paul gives us more instruction, more practical insight. He will deal with how we should function in controversy, specifically controversy arising within the church family. And he starts with this in chapter 14, verse 1. He says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Paul is saying that we are to receive those who are weaker in the faith and that we're not to dispute with them over things that really do not matter. When we don't see eye to eye on things that are in reality inconsequential to salvation. Then, as it says in 1 Timothy 6, we are not to have useless wranglings or arguments as the, these disputes and debates lead to envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicions. And who are these that are weak in the faith? Well, in chapter 14, verse 2, it says this, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. There we go. Who's weak? The vegetarian. 
it makes sense to me. That makes sense. I knew it. Vegetarians, what a bunch of losers. Carnivores are king. Well, that's not necessarily what Paul is speaking about here. What he's alluding to is that the weaker brother is the one, as we're going to continue to see throughout this chapter, the weaker brother is the one who is maybe the more morally upright, the one who is the most rigid in self-discipline, the one who appears to have the highest standards of conduct, but in reality is trapped in legalism. The controversy that Paul is addressing is in regard to meat, specifically a certain type of meat, not meat in general. He's not making fun of vegetarians, no. But there was controversy even in the Roman church about meat. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33, Paul speaks about it to the church in Corinth. What was the big deal? Well, the big deal specifically was meat that was offered to idols. There was issues in the church of that. Some had liberty to, to buy it and eat it. Some felt that if it was offered to an idol, they shouldn't. Well, Paul was asked that question by the church in Corinth. What should we do here? And Paul, in his ever so you know, clear way, spent four chapters answering that question in a very roundabout way, beginning with the question, going on to many other topics, and then coming back to his answer. And his answer in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 33 said this, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is said before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you that this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but rather that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I gave thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense, either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. See, this is the same passage, the same thought that he's referring to here in Romans. That the second-hand meat was being sold in the markets at a discount. And bargain hunters, as we are today, wondering where we can get the best price on things, bargain hunters then would buy it and eat it. It was second-hand because it had been part of the offering to the idols, and that once that was complete, then it would be sold. Some Christians were not bothered by this in the least, saw it as a good value. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Who cares where the meat came from? It's just meat. The idol is nothing, as Paul went on to say. The idol is nothing. It's a hunk of rock. It's a nothing. But he did say, look, there's a demon behind every one. So for conscience sake, for the sake of the, if, you're, if you are convicted by it, don't do it. If you're going to stumble someone else by doing it, don't do it. But he was going through and say, see, seeing that some Christians were extremely bothered by this meat being offered to an idol would refuse to partake of it. Now which of these were the weak ones that Paul was referring to? Well, the ones who were more legalistic in their view, who couldn't act in liberty the ones who were free in exercising the liberty and partaking were viewed as stronger they were free in conscience and able to be grateful to god for the things provided so the more legalistic the more uptight a man is the weaker he is the christian who looks down his nose at other people out of piety and has a rigid list of do's and don'ts and holds to such a level and standard of things allowable and not allowable is considered the weaker Christian in actuality. No movies, no cards, no music, no zippers. Throughout history, there's always been a something. Whatever the non-allowable that is in reality, a useless wrangling. Whatever that non-allowable is, that's what it really is, is a useless wrangling. It does no real eternal good toward salvation. But we are told to respond to the weaker brother in this way. In chapter 14, verse 3. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. 
See, it would be easy for a Christian who felt free to eat that meat to despise others as hopeless legalists. It would also be easy for those who did not eat the meat to judge those who did, seeing them as lesser Christians. Paul's saying, have no part in either side of that. But relax. Just relax. God receives those Christians who eat and those who did not. You see, God really is unconcerned about a whole lot of things that we tend to get upset about, that we tend to fight over, that we tend to debate over. God's agenda is a whole lot different than ours. As we say repeatedly, God is always looking at the heart. What's the heart of the matter? The reality is these types of issues are insignificant when compared to the bigger issues of eternity. We can get so caught up in minuscule rules and regulations, political discussions, theological debates, that we can miss the big picture entirely and we become no better than the Pharisees who are burdening the people of Israel with more and more and more rights and regulations and sub-laws and subsets and actions and things to do that it was an impossible burden to bear. And in the freedom of Christianity, we still do the same thing. I don't think that God really cares about most of the things we discuss endlessly. He's concerned with people being saved, being brought into his kingdom, growing and walking in relationship in his spirit, and growing in grace, real relationship with the living God. Those things are of eternal value. Life transforming salvation. Those are the things on God's heart. Remember what is said in chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then you'll be absolutely able to judge everyone else who isn't as good as you. It doesn't say that. I don't read that there anywhere. It's not even implied. The converse of it isn't there either. To where you read all of that, and then you go, and then exalt in your liberty to the point where you're bordering on sin and just teetering on going back into the world. It doesn't say that either. In fact, what it says in chapter 14, verse 4 is, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed. He will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. And Paul reminds us that it isn't our place to pass judgment on a fellow Christian about their liberty or their standard. Either side of that. About their liberty or their legalism. Their strength or their weakness. There's a lot of useless, harmful division among Christians over silly, insignificant, bigoted things inside the church. And Paul isn't telling Christians to erase their differences. He tells us to rise above our differences as Christian brothers and sisters, for it's God who will make us stand. You know, there's many different denominations with many different viewpoints of doctrine. And I don't, I don't like getting in debates of minutia of doctrine with people from other denominations. I couldn't care less. What I care about is, do you love Jesus Christ as your Savior? Then you know what? We're going to be in heaven someday together, and God's going to look at all of us. And just like the letters to the, to the churches in Revelation, where he's going to go, you know what? You did this well. You did this well. You did this well. You missed on this. We're all going to have that. Points that we miss on. And I don't want to stand in the legalistic judgment of someone else who's trying their best to follow the Lord that may have differences in a view or a minutia or a point of doctrine than I do to the point that it causes division. How does that help the world at all? It doesn't. I also don't want to stand in pride of going, well, you know, Calvary Chapel, we got it together. We, we base it on the Word. We stay in the Word. We worship the Lord. And we just go through the Bible. And we're not off into topics. We're not off into this. We're not off into that. Well, you know what? That's just pride then. We aren't perfect either. All we're trying to do are, is our best to follow the Lord. And if we're standing as a body of Jesus Christ, as the church, then whatever the denomination is, it doesn't matter. 
If we're serving the same Savior, we should be able to get along instead of looking like fools to the world because we can't even tell which side of the Bible to open. You know? We, are, we don't have room for that. We don't have time for that. So Paul isn't telling us to erase the differences. He's telling us to rise above our differences as Christian brothers and sisters because it's God who will make us stand. And why should we view it this way? Because these decisions are a matter of conscience. In chapter 14, verse 5, it says, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. Paul talks about another issue, the aspect of observing specific days. He tells us, uh, he, tells, uh, he lets us know that he's talking more about principles than he is about specific issues. What he's saying is application to more than just eating meat or not eating meat. The controversy was about a day of worship. Should it be on Saturday as the Sabbath is or Sunday observing the day of our Lord's resurrection? And Paul's saying, who cares? It doesn't matter. Worship the Lord on any day. Worship the Lord every day. But if you believe in your conscience, you should observe a day as holy to the Lord, then do it. Whatever we do, we must be able to do it to the Lord. But this is not an excuse to use conscience as a fall guy for obviously sinful behavior. Because he goes on to say in chapter 14, verse 7, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. The key component in the equation of liberty and responsibility. There are those that say Jesus was right when he said, I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. As they eat their meat, live it up in liberty, and worship the Lord every day. Others may say, didn't Jesus say, if any man comes after me, let him take up the cross and follow him? As they enter a monastery and they give up everything for the Lord, and every Saturday they set it apart for just contemplating Jesus. You know, we're blessed that we can learn from, be enriched by, and rejoice with those who are contemplative in their piety, as well as from those who are carefree in their liberty. We're following the Lord. What great latitude the Lord has given us and those sitting next to us in our relationship with Him. Whether we live it up in liberty for the Lord or we give it up for the Lord, we can glorify Him. But the important aspect there is glorifying Him. Because liberty is not an excuse for licentiousness. Liberty is not an excuse for sin. Just as much as as legalism and piety is not an excuse for pride, it's not an excuse for sin. Chapter 14, verse 10 says, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's saying it again. The strict Christian finds it easy to judge his brother, writing him off as an unspiritual, meat-eating compromiser. You're just compromising. The free Christian finds it easy to show contempt against his brother, regarding him as an uptight, legalistic, goody-two-shoes. Paul's answer, essentially, is stop it. Stop doing that to each other. Stop worrying about your brother. You have enough to answer for yourself before Jesus. And he says, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we went over it a couple of weeks ago when Mitch did uh, the, that, that one-man play, when he, when he recited that play about the Bema seat of Christ. That's the judgment seat that Paul's talking about. It's not a judgment seat for eternal salvation versus eternal damnation that Paul's talking about here. But like in 1 Corinthians 3, He's speaking about the Bema seat judgment, the judgment seat or Bema seat. It's equivalent to the judge's seat at the Olympic Games. Because after every event, the winners would come before the judge's seat to receive crowns for first, second, third place, and likewise. The Christian's works are going to be tested by fire, we are told. 
And each Christian will be rewarded for those, the works that remain, the things that we did for Jesus that stand the test of fire. It says that those things done for him will be as gold, silver, and precious jewels. And that we will be rewarded for those things we do for him as we run the race set before us in life. The judgment seat of Christ is only concerned with a Christian's rewards and position in his kingdom, not with salvation. So whether you are on the side of liberty or whether you veer to the side of legalism, we're all going to stand before that judgment seat of Christ and all that stuff will be burnt away. And all I know is I don't care which side of the fence you fall on there, but live your life for that reward, for what God wants to do in you and through you. Because he's going to judge our works, our motives, our heart behind all of it. Was your heart full of pride, thinking how pious you are? Or is your heart full of flesh, exulting in liberty to the point that you're sinning? That's all the junk that's going to get burnt away there. But don't you want to start getting rid of both sides of that now? And just live for him, thinking of the reward that he has for you. Because who's going to judge all that? Well, it won't be us judging each other, going, see, I told you. I told you he was no good. Or I told you he was just a legalistic bum. No, it's going to be Jesus. He's the one we're going to stand before. In chapter 14, verse 11, it says, For it's written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. That quotation's from Isaiah 45, 23. And it's emphasizing the fact that we will all have to appear before God in humility. And we'll give account for ourselves before God. And that being such, we should be willing to let God deal with our brother's idiosyncrasies. That means you don't have to. You don't have to do all that. So the summary of all of it is this. Don't make an issue of judging, but don't use your liberty to stumble another brother. Because that's where he goes on in verse four, or chapter 14, verse 13. He says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Here's the heart of what he's getting to. Whichever side of that you veer towards in your heart, it all has to be tempered by love. All of it. Not judging each other. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus helped us to understand what this means. It means judging others according to a standard that we would not want applied to ourselves. And now it doesn't take away the need and the responsibility for biblical admonishment or rebuke. We're told in Romans 15, and in 2 Timothy 4, that we are to admonish and rebuke if it is necessary. But when we do admonish or rebuke, we do it over clear scriptural principles, not over doubtful things or useless wranglings. We may offer advice to others about doubtful things, but we're not to judge them for that. And we're told a very important principle here as well. Consider this. Do not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. We can cause our brother to stumble and fall in two ways here. We could discourage them or beat them down through our legalism against them. Or we could entice them to sin through an unwise and unloving use of our liberty. Don't stumble over doubtful things. Destroying a brother makes a privilege, a liberty, wrong and sinful. Chapter 14, verse 14. says, I know... And I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Paul knew that there was nothing intrinsically unclean about meat that was not kosher or that had been sacrificed to an idol. Yet there was nothing that could justify the destruction of a Christian brother over something as trivial over what food we ate. The issue now is not the priority of personal liberty. It's walking in love towards one whom Jesus loves and whom Jesus died for. 
You know, there have been a lot of things that the church decided was taboo and then made it a condition of salvation. You know, you, you can't play cards, you're not really saved. You can't go to a movie, you can't smoke, you can't have tattoos. You know, all of that stuff is nothing new. It's been going on from the beginning of the church. Legalism has been going on since the beginning of the church. Why? Well, I'll give you one word, a one-word answer. Here's the reason why. People. <laughs> There's people in the church. And inherently, we just tend to do that. Now, I don't know, have you heard of Charles Spurgeon? Many of you heard of Charles Spurgeon? You know, one of the greatest preachers ever. And he had an issue like this between Charles Spurgeon and another great preacher and pastor of the day, Joseph Parker. They had issues between the, each other. Spurgeon could not understand how Parker could go to the theater and watch plays. Couldn't understand that. <coughs> Saw that as sinful. Parker would come down on Spurgeon for smoking cigars. He thought that was sinful. This is true. They each had a problem with each other for what they exalted in liberty. One felt free to go to the theater and watch a play. One felt free to smoke a cigar. Both of them were at odds with each other over what they saw as their liberty. Both of these men were powerful preachers who were used by the Lord, and yet they had public disagreements over these things. Not private disagreements, public disagreements over these. Spurgeon finally gave up smoking in his later years when one day he opened the London Times newspaper, saw a full-page cigar ad, and on the ad it had this headline, the cigar that Charles Spurgeon smokes. It wasn't what he wanted to be known for. When he saw it, it mortified him. People are often shocked and appalled at how someone else could do something other than what they had have liberty themselves to do. And then we put guilt trips on people. And fights start. Churches split. Historically, entire denominations have actually been formed over slight differences that in reality don't matter at all. But in our humanness, these contentions have caused great divisions. But we are called as Christians to walk in love preferentially toward our brothers and sisters in Christ, building unity, not division. Laying down our rights, not beating someone else over the head with our liberties. We are to pursue the higher call of the kingdom of God. In chapter 14, verse 16, it says, Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who served Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Our liberty in Jesus and freedom from the law is good, but not if we use it to destroy another brother in Christ. Then it would be spoken of as evil. If we place liberties like food and drink before righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, then we're way out of touch with the priorities of God's heart. His heart is preferential love. Considering others before ourselves, that is acceptable to God and approved by men. So our liberty should be used to build each other up, not to tear each other down. In chapter 14, verse 19, it says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with offense. It's neither good to eat meat or drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. He said if it's not sinful, then in essence, everything is pure. But anything which you have a personal problem with is unclean for you. Therefore, determine where you are at, but don't impose your convictions on other people. If eating or drinking something will stumble another brother, then we're not free to eat or drink in that circumstance. Even if we have the personal liberty, we do not have the liberty to stumble, offend, or weaken a brother. However, we also shouldn't think that Paul would permit this kind of heart to cater to someone else's self-righteous legalism. Paul's speaking about stumbling a sincere heart, not catering to the whims of someone's legalism. 
For example, when some Christians from a Jewish background were offended that Gentile believers were not circumcised, Paul did not cater to their legalistic demands. And he also took them to task. He took to task those who made a show of not eating with Gentiles only when other Jews were around. But when the Jews weren't around, they would eat with them. Paul took them to task for the hypocrisy. He didn't abide fools, and he didn't abide legalism. He was not big on abiding those who had pretentious legalistic demands, actions, or expectations. Now, that's true. That was Paul's heart. Now, at the same time, Paul had Timothy circumcised when they were going to travel together. And it says, so as not to offend the Jews. Was he worried about legalism there? No. It was all with the goal of preparing the way for the gospel and not hindering the work of the Spirit. And that was an act of love, not legalism. There's the difference. Paul didn't abide legalism. But he would do what he needed to do in love, preferring the weaker brothers who were still stumbled by the uncircumcised coming in to speak about the Scriptures and give the gospel. So I had Timothy circumcised so as not to hinder the work of the ministry. That was the difference, though. Legalistic hypocrisy or giving up a liberty in love? What did Paul choose there? We chose to give up a liberty in love. And Paul concludes with this principle of faith. In chapter 14, verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If you have strong faith and feel liberty to partake of certain things, well, praise God. (coughs) But have your strong faith before God, not before a brother who will stumble. Not every Christian knows the freedom of What Paul says, happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. There are things God may challenge us to give up. Liberties he may challenge us to give up. But we go on approving them in our life, and when we do that, we deal with condemnation. It may be that the thing is clearly good or clearly bad, but if God is convicting you of the matter, I would encourage you to deal with it. Or you're going to continue to feel the cycle of condemnation. We must ask God if there's anything that hinders a closer walk with Him. That's part of our self-examination. God, am I exulting in a liberty that in reality is leading me into my flesh? Or am I I exulting in a liberty that's drawing me closer to you because it's freeing me from myself? That's the thing. Is it drawing you closer to the Lord? Or is it drawing you more into your flesh? And we, so we've got to ask God to reveal those things because that's what he's talking about in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. To present yourself a living sacrifice. That it is your duty and your reasonable service. And all of it takes faith because we often cling to hindering things because we think they make us happy. The real happiness is found in being closer and closer to Jesus. And Paul concluded that chapter in verse 23 with a principle by which we can judge those gray areas. In essence, he says, if we can't do it in faith, then it's sin. What did he say? He said, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. It's a good check on our tendency to justify ourselves in the things we permit. If we're troubled by something, it likely isn't of faith. And likely it's sin for us. Preferring others in love instead of demanding that others accept our liberties is the heart of it. Laying ourself down for the sake of unity, for the sake of health, for the sake of growth, for the sake of the gospel. In Psalm 133, 1, it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in division and dissension. That's not what it says, is it? No, it says, behold, how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. Which means we need to stop judging each other. We need to stop being legalistic. We need to stop exulting in liberties that border on sin. 
so that we could walk in unity in the Spirit. Augustine summed it up like this. He said, in essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, there must be liberty. But in all things, there must be charity or love. In essentials, there must be unity. We have a whole gospel full of essentials. We have the doctrine that we find in the epistles of essentials. In non-essentials, there must be liberty. But in all things, there must be love. I pray that God gives us the wisdom to walk in both liberty and love. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the freedom that you give us in your word. The freedom to follow you. The freedom to know you. The freedom that we have from the aspects and the minutia and the detail of the law. The things that we could never fulfill in and of ourselves. You fulfilled for us. So that all we need to do is summed up in the commandments you gave us. To respond to the free gift of salvation that you've given us so that we can grow more and more and more in love with you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that when we do out of that, your infilling of the Holy Spirit, you, how you flow through us, allows us then in turn to love other people just as much as we love ourselves. God, that's something that only comes from you. And oh, how we need that work in our lives. I pray that we would submit to your hand. In Jesus' name, amen.